thank you very much, Gillian, for the nice introduction, as, especially for working on dynamic. <laughs> as Sasha is also doing, he, she is really the key central person for the dynamic project. So if you have any question, you can also ask Sasha. So the background, what we wanted to address, uh, the problem of child mortality, who is getting much better in southern country. Here you see the different countries where we are deploying our digital tool, EPOC, within Dynamic and another project called uh, TIMC. And it went down to be uh, around 4 5% for under 5, but we are still like 12 times higher and also Fen is here. I didn't see you. Hi, Fen. <laughs> also strongly involved in the project. Um, 12 times higher than in Switzerland, for example. So there is still a lot of work to do. And there is an, another problem that in fact are much less related than people usually think. It's the huge increase in antibiotic consumption that was especially strong in uh, southern countries and, and middle income countries, as you can see with the purple curve, uh, where it's going up. So it doubled in uh, the last 15, 18 years. People think that giving more and more antibiotics will save lives, but in fact, this is not true. This is not a central key thing that can improve mortality because mortality is especially due to determinants of health, the level of nutrition of a child, prevention, or what pediatricians know very well. And in our countries, mortality due in our countries, I mean, northern countries, the it's mainly hygiene who, who improved mortality. And antibiotic only marginally helped, obviously for severe children in, in specific settings, but not when used as largely, especially in outpatients where uh, most of the diseases are of viral origin. So we wanted really to address these two problems, how to decrease this unnecessary antibiotic prescription that obviously leads to resistance and makes antibiotic not work anymore at all for serious disease. And at the same time, ensure that we are uh, improving uh, quality of care. So we thought, okay, for malaria, it was quite easy. One disease, one rapid test, one medicine, and the management is done. For non-malaria fevers and other diseases, there are, we calculated like 150 pathogens that can make a child sick uh, with fever, for example. So this you cannot handle with a single test. It's a reasoning problem. And that's where digital tools could support a clinician to, to take right decision. So this is part of area six of the different um, tools classified as classified by WHO. So this electronic decision support tool can address uh, problems that are diverse from prevention to a diagnosis, first early triaging of the child, then diagnosis and treatment. And we try to address mainly the three last areas, but also a bit of prevention. And Traditionally, there were two types of tools that were called score calculator that we use in medicine for many, many years. There were also kind of electronic differential diagnosis generators that gives a list of long list of diagnoses. And I will just show that it's not really appropriate for primary care health workers. What we really need is something else that we called at the end CDSA. We had to find a, a name. So who could benefit from which type of algorithm? For patients, they don't need any diagnosis because this will only make them worry, not really understand what they are supposed to do. And I found one app in Netherlands developed by GPs that was quite efficient because it just tell the patient, okay, with this constellation of symptoms, you are safe. You don't need to run to the hospital and just take a bit of paracetamol. And here you can calculate the right dose for your weight, for example. So this is very appropriate. For specialized physicians, we in tropical diseases in Switzerland, we sometimes use one called Gideon. 
And indeed, it gives a long list of diagnoses, and we go to the tip down to see rare diseases that we could have forgotten because it's in a remote place and we didn't know that this disease was existing. But we never look at the first part of the list, which is generally uh, quite wrong. What frontline physicians need is something completely different. They need to know first, do I need to refer the child to the hospital or can I um, do home-based uh, treatment? Second, which lab tests am I supposed to use? Because nowadays there are many different tests for the same disease and it's not easy to find one's way. And the third one is, okay, no lab test is perfect. They all have their limitations. So what in this clinical context I'm facing now, what does this lab test result really mean? So this is all about pre-test, post-test probability, likelihood ratios that we are using nowadays in evidence-based medicine. So once we have chosen the type of tool, we have to look at the patient target and the health problem target. There are some apps who try to cover wall medicine. This is not very realistic because every patient is different and, and you have chronic diseases, you have age problems, etc. So for us, we targeted really first children two months to five years like IMCI and we slowly enlarge the age group to work because this is huge. So Gillian, when she had to enter in below two months, this was one and a half year of development. This is just crazy. So, and then we had to do for five to 14 years, etc. And the other decision to take is what is the level of healthcare I want to work in? Because the app for the physician at the emergency room of a hospital is not at all the same as for a pharmacist or a community health worker in a village. So we have to adapt because the diseases presented by patients are different and the level of knowledge is obviously also different. And then once this is decided, first step, structure review of the literature. This is enormous work. This was our first generation algorithm. This was already 12,000 articles to go through to at the end get very disappointed because in medicine, <laughs> the level of evidence is very low. You have case series, which does not really help. So we had to do our own studies. We thought, okay, nobody knows what is the distribution of diseases in a febrile child, for example. We don't even know that for Switzerland, no clue. So we did it for Tanzania. Uh, where we included more than 1,000 children, and we ended up discovering what any pediatrician knows, in fact, that half of them had a respiratory infection, mostly upper respiratory tract infection. So this is the same as in Switzerland, some urinary tract infection in the youngest one, etc., and some diseases specific, obviously, to southern country like malaria or typhoid fever. But was what was really important from this study is that most of these patients had clearly a viral disease, which means no need to prescribe an antibiotic. Next step was to look at the clinical predictors of each disease. Some diseases we have very good tests like malaria. So here we don't really need them. We have a rapid test, but for typhoid fever, the rapid test is five Swiss francs. This is much too expensive for the South. So we look at what clinical predictors could help to know if the child has a typhoid fever? Not very easy. Other possibility to find some new biomarkers because with 150 different pathogens, you will not do lab tests for each pathogen. You will rather find a biomarker to differentiate a viral from a bacterial disease. This is extremely difficult. And for adults, it works a bit better. This was some new markers for mortality in adults. For children, it's much more fuzzy. And here for radiological pneumonia, we could find one that was called G3L1, but was not much better at the end of the day than CRP. And CRP, uh, C-reactive protein, exists as a rapid test. So we thought, okay, that could be a possibility to try differentiate between viral and, and bacterial disease and guide antibiotic prescription. So once 
we have as experts done all that work, we still need to take into account and, and base ourselves on national guidelines. And they are different for in each country. So for Tanzania, but we did the same for Rwanda, for Senegal, for Kenya, for India. <laughs> uh, we went through all guidelines related to child care and they contradict itself. So one guideline say do A and the other guideline say do B. So you have to take then expert from the country to agree. Okay, we agree. The government decides that a child with this constellation we want them to be treated that way. And we also included the perspective of the, of the field. That was extremely important because healthcare worker at frontline, they have a lot of feedback, obviously. It's like you did to know, okay, this we don't like in the app, this we don't understand, this wording is, is not clear, et cetera. So this was a lot of work to improve and adapt uh, the tool. And from there, we are finally able to design, to write on paper, you know, electronically now, the algorithm. And, and here we, we tested different ways because they become so complex. They are almost three-dimensional. They interact to each other. It was not easy to find the best way to, to organize them, especially to have our IT colleagues to understand what we want to do because we speak completely different languages. Um, and I think the strength of our team is that you have meetings every week between the clinical team and the IT team. So you are really working hand in hand. And sometimes I have to, you know, make when you disagree, I have to decide I'm the one to say, OK, today we give right to the IT people. We cannot do that. This is not reasonable. And other days is, no, clinicians are right. This, we really need it. You have to find a way to solve that. So it's really this that make us able also to develop very quickly during the COVID epidemic some simple tool to guide uh, the population and, and health worker on who to test for COVID and who to vaccinate for COVID. So this is how it looks like a tablet with the algorithm where clinicians enter their data and we have five point of care tests to support diagnosis, not more. This is already more than what they use uh, usually. So the oximeter and the hemoglobinometer because these are strong predictors of severity of disease and reason for referring the child to hospital and malaria, CRP and HIV uh, rapid tests. And sometimes, according to some countries or places, we, we have a urine dipstick or, or a few other tests. So the, at the end, the algorithm will give a recommendation regarding treatment, antibiotic or not, and referral. This is not the end of the story because exactly like for vaccines, for uh, tests, we have to validate them. And we imagine a sort of Faces exactly like vaccine, phase one, phase two, phase three. So for digital tools, phase one will be all what you do in the lab, IT lab, to make it work. And then phase two is a clinical safety and efficacy trial. This is what we had done before in controlled condition, individualized um, uh, randomization at individual level. And then we could move to the dynamic project, which is rather effectiveness, impact, costs. Uh, how you do you adapt the algorithm with the data? How do you take into account the clinical and epidemiological context? And it looks then in practice like that. So let's try the small movie. Saudi is worried this morning. Our 16 month old daughter is sick like many other patients here, with fever, cough, or stomach aches. Cases like that are quite common in primary care facilities, but there are many challenges to receiving quality care due to high case loads, limited diagnostic tools, and little supervision. This explains in part the high childhood mortality, albeit improving still too high in Tanzania. It may also explain why many children receive antibiotics when they don't need it. Overprescribing antibiotics leads to side effects such as diarrhea, and antibiotic resistance. This means that antibiotics may not be able to treat some infections, 
a serious problem that kills as many people every year is HIV or malaria. To improve the quality of care of sick children, some health facilities in the Mbeya and Morogo regions of Tanzania benefit from the use of a novel tablet-based clinical decision support algorithm. This application, called Epoch Plus, supports healthcare workers to systematically ask the appropriate questions and perform relevant physical exams, tests, and assessments in order to help reach the appropriate diagnosis and treatment plan. The use of the application in combination with rapid tests helps identify more easily the children with severe disease and reduce the number of unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions. Once medical results are known, patients come back to the clinician. The tool concludes that Carisha has viral pneumonia, therefore does not need antibiotics. The use of Epoch Plus reassures caregivers that their children are receiving good care. Initial findings on the use of this tool in more than 2,500 children found that the quality of care for sick children has improved. Antibiotic prescriptions like amoxicillin decrease by almost three times when using Epoch Plus. If expanded to more health facilities, more children could receive improved care and antibiotic resistance may decrease. Ultimately, this will help children get better more rapidly and benefit from a longer, healthier life. So to assess the impact of the, the tool that we are deploying, we did a cluster randomized control trial where we took 40 health facilities in two different regions of Tanzania, including children from day one after birth to 15 years of age during um, one year. So 20 health facilities were randomized to receive the intervention and 20 were controlled where they continue with usual care. You can see that we, en we enrolled more than 40,000 children up to now. And the uptake was quite good, obviously, in the control. We had provided tablets with a, an electronic case report form for study purposes without any guidance on diagnostics uh, at all. And in the intervention arm, the same, but with the whole uh, app to, to guide them during consultation. And here you see the uptake gets a bit down because it's a lot of work. It takes time to do a consultation. The problem is that originally health workers have ended by spending like three minutes per patient because there is overload of patients in some places or because they don't really know what to assess in the child. And here we need at least 10 to 12 minutes per child, which is very reasonable when you think that it's a child in, what, that could die of, of a severe disease and really needs uh, acute assessment, accurate assessment. So uh, here we have still room for improvement with 76% uh, of uptake, but it's already quite good. And our core primary outcomes are antibiotic prescription, where we wanted to improve the situation, obviously. And we also look to be sure that our app is safe. We looked at clinical cure at day seven, and this is a non-inferiority uh, analysis. Because we do not expect improvement at outpatient level, because death and severe disease are rather rare events. So at the primary outcome, we can see a huge improvement. It went down from 70%. In fact, we know from baseline that nowadays they are close to 95% of children receiving an antibiotic when entering a health facility. So there was also some influence of us being around, <laughs> explaining that prescribing too many antibiotics is not good. So you have a small effect and you are at 70% in control facilities. And in the intervention, three times less antibiotics are prescribed. So a 50%, uh, almost 50% difference. So this is 
obviously very interesting for governments also, even if they are, don't know exactly about uh, quality of care, just seeing how much money they could save by uh, using less medicine is obviously a, a strong incentive. Regarding the, the clinical outcomes at day seven, so the primary outcome of clinical failure at day seven, you see that we have exactly the same, so there is no significant difference. So we could reach non-inferiority, we are thus safe. For this, you see it's extremely rare among all these patients. And here we don't see uh, any difference neither, that we did not have the power to look at that. What is interesting is that we see some reduction in unplanned reattendance visit. And I think this is really positive because it means probably the initial management was of better quality. We have also indicators around quality of care that clearly show that they will measure weight much more often. They will look at MUAC and many things that improves quality of care and probably makes parents come uh, less often during the episode. And we did not see, as some people were fearing, that without giving antibiotics at day zero, they would run to the first pharmacy parents to buy an antibiotic. And this was clearly not the case. 7% in both arms were still purchasing an antibiotic or other medication after the initial consultation. So all this data, obviously sent by health centers uh, from the tablet, can go on, on our different servers, tools, etc. especially on a, on a, for now, it's a server at the research institutions in the countries, but later on, it's aimed at being at the government level. And we also try to enhance the system by uh, providing mentoring to clinicians because we can show them their own data and they can see if they perform well compared to other clinicians. We do that really in a positive way, not as being, you know, policemen checking what they do on the contrary, but this they have to be careful. And we also added some targeted microbiological investigation, looking at patterns of data that would suggest an epidemic and decide, okay, now we have to investigate why suddenly do we see so many children with diarrhea? Could there be a cholera epidemic around that has not been uh, picked up by the government so that we can give them reports and, and dashboards to follow uh, and take decision? Challenges, we have many for going at scale because this is the aim. We have a five-year project that will finish in about one year. And what do we do? Obviously, clinicians are very excited, researchers are very excited, governments also sometimes, most of the time. But they probably are more aware than us of the big challenges we have in front of us. First, it's true that it's uh, quite heavy in terms of technology and, and high level of knowledge to create an algorithm. As a clinician, it's not all clinicians who know to do that. So we have really to transfer knowledge to the South. We have to share with them. That's what we try to do from the beginning. But still, we, we have a lot of work in front of us. Government need to have a specialized team at the MOH to be able to manage themselves with algorithms and tool on the long term. The tool is not resolving all problems. It's, it has to be embedded within a full package of intervention like training of healthcare worker, because if you put, you know, with machine learning wrong in, wrong out, that means if they don't know how to examine a child, whatever data they can enter, the diagnosis will be wrong. So there is a need to enhance clinical, clinical skills, mentoring, supporting, material maintenance, and this has to be done by the districts and the ministries of health. And one other problem we face is nowadays they have so many digital tools on their desk. They have, they have one for HIV, one for another vertical pro program. They have the electronic ready code system. They have our tool, they have a vaccination tool. We have to merge all this because they get completely crazy, these poor people. And we need to reprogram our tools within the electronic medical record system. But each country has a different system. So we have to find IT people, and IT people are not so many around, uh, 
uh, to do all the reprogramming. We have also to purchase uh, some uh, products, but these are few. And what Tanzania said, anyway, we cannot go further if not every health facility and every school, in fact, has access first to electricity, to network, and I would also add to water. <laughs> Sometimes we work in places where we have, they have tools, but no water. So the power supply was really a challenge. As soon as it stops, everything goes wrong. And this is what also um, worries me, is that we have many challenges, access to energy and material to create our tool, to support the servers. And this has a huge environmental impact. Uh, you know that the, the share of um, gas emission will uh, be around 10% of all emission will be due to IT. So we could in fact harm uh, countries and harm uh, child health by deploying a lot of heavy material that in fact will disturb even further the climate. So we looked at the environmental impact of our intervention to see if we save more life than we harm by the environmental impact. So we did what we call a life cycle analysis of our wood intervention. This is the scope looking at really what we deployed, not for research purposes, but really in, within the health system. And this is what we found was unexpectedly, it was not the digital tools where has the worst uh, level of uh, CO2 emissions, it's in fact medical, because it's rapid test, it's uh, medicine, especially that are prescribed that have the largest impact of soil pollution, water pollution, CO2 emission, etc. And that's why we, by avoiding all the antibiotics prescription, we improved the, the impact and the net result is that our environmental impact is limited. Limited because we didn't count uh, machine learning analysis. And machine learning, you can see it explodes completely emission. So we should use it only when useful. You can see here that the prediction of diseases did not improve, in fact, with machine learning. We should not use it for this purpose, maybe other purposes. And this is also the impact on human health through the environment and ecosystems. We have also ethical problems because all these tablets and material are requiring, as you know, rare uh, metals that are taken by children that also die of trying to create our tablets. So we have really to think about having a fair tablet. There are fair phones. I use a fair phone, which ensures that all material has been uh, taken from, not from children working in these type of conditions. And we have not, we should not store data on long term, we should take out what we don't use anymore. Because at the end, we really have this ethical problem. Digital health is a limited resources, like all resources, we will not be able to continue in the future to go 4G, 5G, whatever, this will not be possible. So we have to choose the priorities. Is it us doing jogging in the north or take, saving life in the south? That's a, a big question. And here is the whole team, especially Sasha at Swiss TPH, who is here, Fen also at Unisante in Lausanne, many people working, but mainly um, our local PIs in Tanzania and, and Rwanda and all the team here in this picture, thanks to them.